Um, members wishing to ask constituency or general supplementaries, please press their buttons during question two. Members wishing to ask supplementaries on questions three to six, please press during the relevant question. Question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. On the 14th of December, I asked the First Minister to confirm that vital financial support needed by the businesses affected by her COVID restrictions would be delivered before Christmas. She stood there and promised to do everything possible to deliver that, and the First Minister has failed. Many businesses have contacted us to say they can't even apply for that funding yet, let alone receive a single penny. So can the First Minister tell us how many businesses in Scotland have so far received funding and how many are waiting to receive it? First Minister. Well, this is uh, an important issue for many businesses across the country. Before Christmas, I said, and I repeat again today, the Scottish Government, in partnership with local authorities who are responsible for administering uh, the significant bulk of the funding that we have made available are working to get that money to businesses as quickly as possible. As I'm sure everybody will accept, uh, including, I hope, Douglas Ross, there are some checks that councils have to do to guard against uh, fraud in any businesses, and I'm not suggesting uh, that uh, many uh, would, uh, would try to claim money they weren't entitled to. Uh, that process is ongoing uh, for the hospitality strand, for example. Uh, businesses who previously got support uh, have been contacted the vast bulk of them will have been contacted. They have been asked to complete a declaration and then money will start to flow when those declarations have been returned. I know many councils uh, are in the process now of making the payments. So Edinburgh, Midlothian, for example, have started to make payments. Glasgow uh, are starting today on the back of that process. The nightclubs fund, uh, which I know there has been commentary on uh, this week, uh, again, that is open for applications. Uh, nightclubs are being asked to submit an application. As soon as they do, then money will be allocated to them uh, within days of that. So this is an ongoing process, but everybody is working hard to get the money into bank accounts of businesses as quickly as possible. And finally, presiding officer, I would just remind particularly uh, Douglas Ross uh, that where the Conservatives are in power, a touchy subject I know today, but where the Conservatives are in power. Uh, some of this money is not being provided at all to businesses because this government, this government has made sure, has made sure that we are providing financial support to businesses. Many businesses suffering the same impact of COVID south of the border are not getting the money that they will get in Scotland. Douglas Ross. So, so let's just look at the First Minister's answer. Apparently, this is an important issue, yet she couldn't tell us how many businesses yeah. in Scotland yes. have received the funding and how many businesses are still waiting. She stood in this chamber and promised to do everything possible to deliver the funding before Christmas. And here we are in the middle of January. And businesses are telling us the process is going at a snail's pace. But the First Minister somehow defends it or blames councils for not acting quickly enough. The responsibility is on the Scottish Government. Absolutely. The SNP in Scotland added these restrictions which have impacted businesses, but they have not delivered the funding. One business group said yesterday, and I quote, a business group here in Scotland, not a single penny of funding we were promised before Christmas has reached businesses. And now, a month after the funding was announced, John Swinney came forward to say it is difficult to give a precise timescale on when this money will be paid, a month after it was announced. First Minister, this has happened time and time again during the pandemic. The SNP are quick to demand more funding from the UK Government, but very slow to actually get it out to the businesses who need it. So, First Minister, is a month-long wait for this vital funding really good enough for our businesses? First Minister. Well, at least under an SNP government, money is being allocated to businesses and will get to businesses. Under a Tory government, money is not getting to businesses at all. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure if either central government or local government was to disperse money without basic checks to guard against uh, fraud, for example, Douglas Ross would be one of the first to get to his feet and complain about that as well. So if we take, for example, the nightclub closure fund, uh, but that 
is open for application. Businesses who previously received support are being contacted. They're being asked to complete their application, and then payment will be made within a matter of days once that uh, application has been received. The hospitality uh, fund, for example, uh, again, uh, they are only being asked to complete a declaration, not a new application. Uh, businesses are being proactively contacted and councils are starting now. Some councils have already started, others are starting today to pay that money. Again, you know, we are doing this. I'm not criticising councils. I know how hard councils are working and how quickly councils are working to get this money out of the door. But I come back to this point. We all want this to be done as quickly as possible. Uh, but businesses in every part of the UK are suffering some of the same impacts of COVID, uh, but in Scotland, businesses will be getting financial support that they are not getting where the Conservatives are in government south of the border. <laughs> Douglas Ross. Businesses in other parts of the United Kingdom were not shut down in the same way they were exactly. shut down by exactly. Nicola Sturgeon. Exactly. We all remember her Public Health Scotland telling people not to go to Christmas parties. The next day, the First Minister came onto TV to confirm that. That's why funding is required yeah. here in Scotland, yeah. and that's why it was required in December, not the middle of January. Yeah. And, and the First Minister said this is because there are basic checks to be made to ensure that money goes to the right people. We can't make the basic checks if, in some areas, the application process hasn't even opened. This is the problem that businesses are telling us. Uh, and this week, here in Scotland, Businesses were dealt another blow. Restrictions on them were extended by a further week without any clear evidence. The Omicron data is now far more positive. The First Minister herself has accepted that the government's projections in December were wrong. So why are hospitality businesses still being held back by her government? And can the First Minister explain to people across Scotland why, on one hand, it's safe for tens of thousands of people to now go to stadiums, but it's not safe to walk from your seat to the bar in the local pub. First Minister. Dear me, I mean, first of all, I mean, I can't believe Douglas Ross must be the only person in the entire country in the run-up to Christmas didn't uh, hear uh, the howls from hospitality businesses south of the border about the collapse in footfall and the loss of revenue and the dire straits they were in. He's standing here trying to suggest that businesses in every part of the UK haven't suffered uh, these COVID impacts. Uh, but the difference in Scotland, of course, is that the Scottish Government has responded in a way much greater than, business, than the Government has south of the border. The application, I've already said, uh, again, you know, Douglas Ross might just want to listen on hospitality. It's a case of businesses being contacted, asked to complete a declaration. That process is underway. That money has started to flow. Um, in terms of the nightclub closure fund, the application process is open and that money will be flowing soon as well because we take our uh, responsibilities seriously to actually allocate money and then get that money to businesses in a way that the Tory government is simply not doing to anywhere near the same extent. And secondly, the projections uh, before Christmas were not wrong. Uh, what happened is that we didn't just uh, fold our arms and accept those projections as inevitable. Yeah. We took proportionate sensible, balanced action. Uh, the public responded, as they have done throughout this pandemic, magnificently, and we were able to change the course of those projections. Um, if Douglas Ross had been standing here, uh, something that I know is hard to contemplate for people in Scotland, and even harder for some people in his own party, it seems, uh, but if Douglas Ross had been standing here, is he really saying that he would have not responded to those projections in December? Because if that had been the case, we would be in a seriously, seriously difficult position right now. Because we took sensible action, we are now lifting those restrictions, but we are doing so in a phased and responsible way. And finally, presiding officer, had I followed the advice of Douglas Ross over these past months, uh, we wouldn't have face coverings still being used in Scotland. We wouldn't have some of the mitigations we have in schools. We would not have taken many of the sensible actions we've taken, and we'd be in a much worse position than we are in right now. So I'll continue to follow a sensible, responsible course to lead this country as safely as possible through the remainder of this pandemic. Douglas Ross. If the First Minister had listened to me in December, listened to the voices from the Scottish Conservatives, businesses would not be telling her in January that they're not getting the funding that they need. She says I have to listen to her answers. First Minister, please listen to the businesses that are telling you 
Here in Scotland, you made a promise to them that you failed to deliver, and they are waiting for this vital funding. This is to protect their businesses. This is to protect jobs. And shaking your head and dismissing what they are saying yeah. undermines everything they are trying to do to keep their business alive through the toughest possible time. The First Minister tells us to live with COVID, but then she won't trust the public. She imposes restrictions but doesn't deliver compensation. She says the data on Omicron and COVID is more promising, and then she threatens businesses with a wider vaccine passport scheme. She demands more money from the UK government and then doesn't give it to the businesses here in Scotland. When our economic recovery is so fragile, it simply isn't good enough. First Minister, why are Scottish jobs and Scottish businesses always an afterthought for you and your government? First Minister, that's just not for the first time from Douglas Ross uh, arrant nonsense. Um, we can't give more money from the UK government uh, to Scottish businesses because we didn't get the more money from the UK government, uh, not just the Scottish government, uh, but the Welsh government and the Northern, Northern Irish government uh, asked for. Uh, we managed to find within our own resources um, additional money so that we can get extra support to Scottish businesses because we do accept how important it is uh, in the face of this ongoing challenge to provide as much support as we possibly can for businesses. So we are in a process right now, Scottish Government working with local government to get that money out of the door into the bank accounts of businesses. And I come back to a central point. That is money that will get to businesses, that counterpart businesses in uh, south of the border will not get, even although they have suffered much of the same impact as businesses here in Scotland are suffering. And I don't know, I, I lose track week uh, on week as to what exactly Douglas Ross thinks we should or, or shouldn't do uh, to tackle COVID. Uh, all, I can, all, all I can conclude is that Douglas Ross's approach to tackling a global pandemic is simply to oppose everything that the Scottish Government tries to do. Um, thank goodness he hasn't been responsible for these difficult decisions because on his display in opposition the country would be in a sorry mess over COVID uh, had he had anything to do with these decisions. So we will continue to take responsible decisions, we will continue to support businesses and we will continue to lead this country as safely as possible through the COVID pandemic. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Presenting officer, almost 10 months ago, the First Minister said her focus was on getting the NHS back to normal. But today, almost two years into the pandemic, things are getting worse and not better. And while I accept Omicron has put more pressure on our NHS services, many of the promises we are facing were avoidable. In September, residents in Lanarkshire were told to expect delayed and cancelled operations as the health board was put into code black. This week, they have gone further introducing a suspension of many GP services for at least the next four weeks. Patients were told that NHS services would be cut, except for the ones that, in the Health Board's words, they would never wish to stop. This is an unprecedented situation, affecting the health and well-being of over 650,000 Scots. Isn't it the case that for people in Lanarkshire, their entire health service has now effectively been turned into an emergency-only service? First Minister. No, that is not uh, the case. Let me reflect on the first point Anna Sarwar made though, there, which is that 10 months ago uh, I stood here and I uh, accept that that will be the case and said that we were focusing at that point on getting the NHS back to normal and back on track. 10 months ago, uh, if my memory serves me correctly here, we had not uh, had the Delta uh, variant, uh, nor of course had we had the Omicron variant. This pandemic it has dealt us two significant additional blows uh, since uh, that period 10 months ago. So I accept that that means that what we had hoped would be the case in terms of the... Uh, Anna Sauer is saying it's after Delta. That may or may not be the case. But what, what, what I'm saying here, and I think any reasonable person listening to this would accept, is that this pandemic it has continued to deal us blows that we weren't necessarily anticipating. So yes, that means that our NHS is still struggling with the weight of COVID in a way that we all hoped wouldn't be the case by now. But our NHS boards, those working in the NHS, uh, every single day right now uh, are undertaking that task uh, magnificently. Now, in terms of Lanarkshire, uh, NHS Lanarkshire uh, has uh, operationalised at level two of their GP escalation framework. That's not the most serious level. Uh, there are uh, level zero, one, two and three 
of that. That is something that they have initially said is for a four-week basis, uh, but we have asked them to review that weekly um, and report to the Scottish Government uh, on the status of that. They previously had to do that at an earlier stage of the pandemic in 2020. And that ensures that given the staff absences that are being experienced, and experienced right now, they can continue to focus uh, on the patients who most need care. None of us want to be in this position. Uh, we hope we'll be out of this position uh, sooner rather than later. But that involves all of us continuing to take the responsible action to get COVID under control so that we can get our NHS fully back to normal. Anna Sarwar. The, the First Minister says that, that that's not the case in terms of emergency-only services, but the previous guidance was, did not include primary care. This now does include primary care. And they have said it's now essentially only protecting what they call never services. And I think it's also important to note that this was after Delta, to what the First Minister says. So we can't say that this is all due to Omicron, because NHS Lanarkshire was warning of pressure last July. Code Black was put into place in October. That was long before Omicron arrived in the UK. But by allowing the situation in NHS Lanarkshire to reach crisis levels, the First Minister has let down patients and staff who believed her when she said there was a recovery plan in place. And across Scotland, over 650,000 people are now languishing on NHS waiting lists. 60,000 people have been on a waiting list for more than a year. In one month alone, over 1,600 operations were cancelled just hours before they were due to happen. The number of people and the length of time they are waiting keeps going up. First Minister, you promised a recovery and a catch-up plan. Shouldn't recovery mean that things are getting better, not worse? And shouldn't catch-up mean the waiting lists are coming down, not mounting up? First Minister. Well, firstly, and I don't say this to be pedantic, but it is a really important part of the context. Anna Sarwarni's first question, I think the official report will bear me out here, referred to something I said 10 months ago um, and then tried to say that that was somehow uh, after Delta. Delta was identified as a variant of concern, I think, in May, April, May uh, last year. Um, and since Delta, which caused significant uh, additional disruption to the health service and society, we, of course, had Omicron and we've been dealing with that since. So none of us want to be in this position, but I think any reasonable person uh, would realise uh, that that has seriously frustrated the attempts on the part of the NHS, just as it has attempts across wider society to get back to normal. That's the context that we are dealing in. Now, in terms of uh, Lanarkshire, uh, Anna Sarwar, I think, uh, I think, is mixing up uh, two different escalation frameworks. There is the uh, Scottish Government Board Performance Escalation Framework, which he has cited to me before in the context of the Queen Elizabeth uh, University Hospital. But at the start of the pandemic, uh, the GP escalation framework was also put in place, which goes from uh, level zero to level three. Lanarkshire is currently at level uh, two, which is uh, the practices may need to request reduced access uh, to some uh, services in order to focus on uh, the most serious patients. That has been put in place in Lanarkshire for a short period. We have asked for it to be reviewed weekly. In terms of waiting times more generally, uh, we are focusing uh, as much as possible on supporting boards uh, to recover the position in terms of backlogs in waiting times, uh, but key to doing that is to reduce the pressure that's on boards and in hospitals that is being caused by COVID. Now, hopefully, uh, over the next few weeks, as we start to see the Omicron uh, position ease, that will happen, and those recovery efforts can escalate and accelerate. This is a really difficult position uh, for the NHS, but it is one we need to support it through. Uh, but the sooner we get COVID back under control, the sooner those efforts can step up again. Anna Sarwar. The, the First Minister said 10 months ago the first time that we get the NHS back to normal, and the Health Secretary published the catch-up plan after the election in May, after Delta too. So we, ex what patients would expect, and it's reasonable to expect, is after almost two years of this pandemic, they are getting back to the normal NHS services access to basic health services so we can protect people's lives eh, and livelihoods. Eh, Presiding officer, Nicola Sturgeon wants to pretend that all the problems in the NHS are because of the pandemic. But she has been in government for 14 years and she has been First Minister for seven years. The NHS was under-resourced and undervalued by this government before the pandemic. We had a workforce crisis before the pandemic. There were over 3,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies. And let's not forget that Nicola Sturgeon, as Health Secretary, cut the number of training places. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine say that we are at least 1,000 beds short 
in the NHS, this government cut double that. And there was a staggering 450,000 of our fellow Scots on NHS waiting lists even before the pandemic. Yep. Presenting officer, patients are suffering, staff are burnt out. Isn't it the case that we don't just need a recovery plan from COVID, we need a recovery plan from 14 years of this SNP government? First Minister. Well, of course, the, the, the people of Scotland had the opportunity to make that choice less than a year ago, and they, of course, uh, recorded their verdict um, on that. On the issue of uh, the pandemic impact. I, I don't, uh, for a second, uh, suggest that all of the challenges faced by the National Health Service are down to the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, the NHS was dealing uh, with changing demographics, with uh, the impact of technology. Uh, all of that was putting uh, a pressure on the National Health Service, and we stood here and uh, had exchanges on that then. I think, though, it is the case that Anna Sarwar seems to try to deny uh, the significant uh, impact that COVID has had and is having on the National Health Service. If you take just, just over uh, the, the most recent period as it's been dealing with Omicron, there's been a 65 per cent increase in COVID-related staff absences in the National Health Service. That's the kind of pressure the NHS is dealing with. Uh, now, we need to get that under control. We need to bring the NHS and the country out of this pandemic and get back uh, to making sure that we're dealing with these other challenges. But that's where I come back to uh, the, the starting point of my answer, because under this government, we have put in place the solid foundations to do that. So health spending is at a record high level in Scotland right now. Staffing, NHS staffing is at a record high. And since this government came to office, NHS staffing has increased by 27,000 whole-time equivalent staff. So we have put in place those foundations. We need to get through COVID, and then we will support our NHS to recover uh, in full and to continue to deliver the services that patients across Scotland need and deserve. We will now move to supplementary questions, and I call Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister if she agrees that the unmasked disdain the UK Government has shown in the last 24 hours for their own colleagues in Scotland, dismissing their Scottish leader as a lightweight makes it crystal clear that Scotland needs to become an independent country so we can escape the sleazy, corrupt and criminal Westminster system for good. I, um, I think, as we've just seen, have big political differences with Douglas Ross, uh, but even a high, I'm not as derogatory about him as his own Tory colleagues uh, are being. Uh, you know, not, not a big figure, lightweight. These might be personal insults directed at the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, but actually they say something much deeper about the Westminster establishment's utter contempt for Scotland. Uh, if they can't even show basic respect for their own colleagues, what chance do the rest of us have. The fact is, Westminster thinks Scotland doesn't need to be listened to, can be ignored, and now we're being told we have to thole a Prime Minister that his own colleagues think is not fit for office. Uh, Presiding officer, independence is fundamentally about empowerment and aspiration. But you know what? An added benefit of being independent is that we'll no longer have to put up with being treated like something on the sole of Westminster's shoe. And I suspect today even Douglas Ross finds that a really attractive proposition. I call Sue Webber. Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, we have a number of people in hospital that have missed their vaccination appointments. And the First Minister stated in her answer to my colleague Rachel Hamilton that this was due to clinical reasons. Could the First Minister investigate the possibility of reviewing the policy and the protocols in acute hospital settings to give these patients to anyone else who wants an inpatient vaccine? First Minister. Uh, yeah, I am happy to ask the Health Secretary to uh, look at that to see whether any change is required to be made. Um, but I would repeat again uh, and, and ask the member to uh, take uh, this in, in good faith. There is no blanket policy in place right now that stops inpatients in hospitals getting a vaccination if their clinician thinks that they should get the vaccination. Um, so if we can accept that that is the case, I will absolutely undertake to see if there is anything else in the, the wider protocols 
that is leading to a situation where people who could or should be getting the vaccination are not getting it. So I'll ask the Health Secretary to look at that and uh, write to the member once he's had the opportunity to do so. Call Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I listened to the First Minister's reply to Anna Sarwar. I have to be really blunt here. People in Lanarkshire are very afraid of becoming sick. And for those who are already unwell physically and mentally, they're at breaking point because many have been on waiting time since before the, the pandemic. People at Liz Barry, who I've mentioned before, the Code Black situation has been going on now for 12 weeks. First Minister, I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary, who I think is sitting beside you, um, on the 9th of December, asking for an urgent meeting with all the MSPs in Lanarkshire, because we're all worried, and I didn't even get a response. So can I ask the First Minister, what am I supposed to tell constituents in Lanarkshire who are reaching for the Samaritan Scotland phone number because they can't get through to GP surgeries, they feel they're not allowed to go to a &E. The letter from NHS Lanarkshire yesterday didn't even mention mental health. So it's very scary to hear suspension of services when you are not a doctor and you can't decide if you actually are a, an urgent uh, person. So please, First Minister, can we get that meeting that I asked come to yourself for and can we get sight of a plan so that people in Lanarkshire can start to sleep better at night, please? First Minister. Well, look, I understand that not just for patients in Lanarkshire, but for patients uh, across Scotland and indeed for the wider public, this is a really anxious time uh, because of the ongoing challenges of COVID and the impact that is having on the National Health Service, secondary care and primary care, but also the impact that is having in many aspects of life that pre-COVID people would have taken uh, for granted as normal. All of us want to get that back to normal as quickly as possible. Key to that is getting and keeping COVID under control. And as we do that, and as we come out of COVID, supporting the NHS to recover. The step that's been taken in NHS Lanarkshire, um, of course, nobody wants any health board to be in that uh, position, uh, but it is about ma making sure that they can maintain access to essential GP services at a time of unprecedented demand and also unprecedented staff absences. People, of course, uh, can continue to use uh, GP services where that's essential, wider community pharmacy services, NHS Inform, uh, where they have uh, questions or, or queries uh, that they need answered. This is a short-term measure. Uh, nobody uh, wants uh, or will allow it to be in place for longer than necessary, and we will continue to take steps to support the NHS to get all services back to normal as quickly as possible for all patients across the country. Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Uh, this week, we've seen tens of thousands of young people successfully apply for the national entitlement cards that will open the door to free bus travel across Scotland at the end of this month. And we've also seen some schools and libraries help those who are the hardest to reach to apply for the card. So can I ask the First Minister, what more guidance can the government give to councils to make sure that those who could benefit the most from the scheme successfully get their cards by the end of the month? First Minister. Well, firstly, I'm delighted, as I'm sure uh, many people are, that applications are now open for free bus travel for young people under 22. Uh, the scheme goes live from the 31st of January and it will make public transport so much more affordable for children and young people. Uh, obviously, local authorities are key delivery partners, so we have already provided them with a toolkit to help them communicate the scheme to local residents, including providing information on the range of ways uh, in which people can apply. Um, as Mark Ruskell has said, in some areas, schools are coordinating applications on behalf of pupils. Other councils are using public libraries, um, and uh, all partners are working hard to make the application process as accessible as possible. We know that some people might need additional support, so we're working uh, with delivery partners to make sure that all young people and their families can be reached so that they're aware of the scheme and know what they need to do to make an application. But I'd hope that everyone across Parliament will recognise the substantial social and economic benefits the scheme will bring for children, young people and families, and crucially uh, as well for our climate and environmental uh, policies. And I hope everybody uh, across the Parliament will help promote it to young people and families in their own constituencies. John Mason. Hey, thank you. We understand that this weekend uh, new EU health certification rules will come into effect. Uh, has the Scottish Government had any reassurance from the UK Government that Scottish exporters will not be damaged by yet more delays at borders? 
First Minister. Well, we, on an ongoing basis, seek assurances from the UK Government uh, that the implications of Brexit will not uh, cause disruption or indeed continued disruption uh, to Scottish exporters. I, I don't think uh, I could say that we've been given adequate assurances because I'm not sure there are adequate assurances that can be given. Uh, Brexit, by its very nature, all that it brings in its wake uh, causes disadvantage and disruption. The Scottish Government, for our part, uh, will seek to do everything we can to support businesses through that, but it does underline again the fact uh, that Brexit is something that is against Scotland's interests and has been done to us against our democratic wishes. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, Presiding officer, at the Common Select Committee this week we heard that 400 jobs had been lost at Aberdeen Airport since the start of the pandemic. Can the First Minister outline what support the Scottish Government will give to our airports, or is this industry an uh, another industry that the First Minister has turned her back on? First Minister. Well, we continued, of course, uh, just as one example of the support uh, we are giving to businesses, uh, aviation businesses, the, the rates relief that leisure and hospitality and aviation businesses uh, were entitled to. We uh, extended that for another year. I think, uh, if I'm getting this wrong, I will stand corrected, but I think that is more than the UK government uh, did uh, around uh, aviation. So already we're providing additional support. Airports, uh, aviation, the travel sector more generally have been very severely hit by the pandemic, not just in Scotland or the UK, but across Europe and the world. And we will do everything we can uh, to support the sector uh, as it gets back to normal, as hopefully it does as we come out of the Omicron wave. Question number three, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, officer. To ask the First Minister what deadline the Scottish Government has set for making any further changes to this year's examinations process. First Minister. Well, given that we are still living through a global pandemic, contingencies are needed in education as in all other aspects of life. Right now, should any of those contingencies uh, be required, and there are two key contingencies in education as far as exams are concerned, then we would obviously notify that as soon as possible. Uh, however, uh, firstly, I hope that is not uh, the case. I hope we do not need to activate uh, those contingencies. And as has been clear since August, uh, our firm intention uh, this year is that exams will go ahead. Oliver Mundell. The First Minister is right. Uh, contingencies are needed, but not the type her government proposes. She should be guaranteeing that exams take place this year. And does she reflect negatively on the Cabinet Secretary's confirmation yesterday at the Education Committee that no additional resources are being put in place to allow that to happen safely? What's happened to suggestions of acquiring larger community spaces? What about uh, putting uh, additional invigilators in place? And what about one-to-one -one support, most importantly, for those young people who've lost out on their learning? First Minister. Well, Oliver Mundell says that the contingencies we've put in place are not the type that should be put in place. I think that's probably a standard for the Conservatives. We say uh, one thing, they'll say yeah. another. But let me say what those contingencies are so that people can judge for themselves. The first contingency is that if education is further disrupted, which we all hope it won't be because of developments in the pandemic, then additional support will be provided for those studying for exams. Um, I'm interested that Oliver Mundell doesn't think that's an appropriate contingency. I think it is uh, indeed an appropriate contingency. The second contingency is that if public health advice says that it wasn't safe for young people to come uh, together to sit exams in the traditional way, then we'd go back to uh, a situation akin to the last two years where we would have teacher judgment uh, uh, coming to bear instead of exams. Again, I think an appropriate contingency. We don't want to have to use either of those contingencies because we want exams uh, to go ahead because we think that's in the interest of young people. But lastly, presiding officer, Oliver Mundell asked me to guarantee things. I would really love uh, to be able to guarantee all sorts of things, but we are still living through a global pandemic. In the last, as we've just um, in my exchange with Anna Sarwa, we've just been reflecting on we've had two new variants of this in the last few months alone. None of us can guarantee the immediate future uh, in the context of this pandemic, but we make plans based on what we hope will be the case. And right now, that is to allow young people to sit their exams this year as normal, but have sensible and appropriate contingencies in, contingencies in place in case uh, something happens that makes that impossible. Willie Rennie. To be frank, the Education Secretary has made a right mess of this. She, she issued two conflicting statements within two days, including making a major announcement on Twitter, which is hardly the forum for such a major announcement. 
There was, there was such confusion that the SQA had to step in to clarify. Does the First Minister think this is the right way to treat pupils preparing for exams right now? First Minister. I, I just think that's a complete misrepresentation uh, of the position, if I, I may say so. The, the Education Secretary set out, I'm sorry if Willie Rennie uh, missed it, but the Education Secretary set out, I think in a statement to this Parliament, uh, I think in August last year, what the intention uh, was of the Scottish Government in relation to exams this year, that exams would go ahead. But as she was reflecting, as I have just reflected again, when we're living through a global pandemic, there has to be contingencies in place. But that intention for exams to go ahead hasn't changed. And if he's uh, referring to the same uh, Twitter exchange uh, I saw, uh, what the Education Secretary was rightly seeking to do was not make announcements on Twitter, uh, but to deal with some of the confusion that I think, uh, if I may say, uh, presiding officer has been added to uh, by the misrepresentations of opposition politicians, as we've just heard from Willie Rennie. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government will take to urgently progress the green transition in North Ayrshire following the closure of Hunterson B Power Station on 7th of January. First Minister. Well, the workers at Hunterson B have made a really valuable contribution to our energy security over very, very many years, and I have no doubt they will continue to distinguish themselves through the safe decommissioning of the site. Uh, while this will rightly take time, we must plan and invest in the green transition of North Ayrshire. We have invested £103 million into the Ayrshire Growth Deal, and we are working with partners to deliver projects which I know will help create the good green jobs that are needed in the region. It will also publish a draft energy strategy and just transition plan this year, setting out how we will work with businesses, trade unions and communities to manage the economic and social impacts of a changing energy system. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The closure of Hunterson B is the end of an era for North Ayrshire, regardless of one's view of nuclear power. 125 jobs have been lost, with more to follow over the next eight years as the plant defuels and is then decommissioned. Significant investment bringing 900 jobs is being considered in terms of subsea solar energy cable manufacturing at Hunterson Port and Resource Centre. Does the First Minister agree that the efforts of Scottish Government agencies working with North Ayrshire Council must be redoubled and ongoing to attract and consider further potential job-creating developments at Hunterson? First Minister. Yes, I agree very much. I mean, as Kenny Gibson uh, knows all too well, I grew up in North Ayrshire, not too far from Hunterston B Power Station, so I know firsthand how important it has been over many years uh, to the local economy there. So it is important as it decommissions uh, that we do support that green transition. Uh, the Ayrshire growth deal is central to that. The Scottish Government and our agencies are working with regional partners to support the delivery of Hunterson Port uh, and Resource Centre uh, projects, the proposed subsea cable that Kenny Gibson refers to, as well as multiple other projects across Ayrshire that are included within the deal. Uh, these projects, uh, of course, are led and driven uh, by colleagues in North Ayrshire Council on behalf of the wider deal, uh, but it is really important that we fully support that, and I can give an assurance that the Scottish Government uh, will continue to do so. Katie Clark. Last month, I raised with the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise that whilst North Ayrshire Council have set up a task force to look at the economic development at Hunterson, their ambition has always been that the Scottish Government be involved with a ministerial task force to look at the development of the Hunterson Park site. Is this something that the First Minister will look at, given how important it is to ensure that good quality trade unionised green jobs are created, but also that given that it's an area of environmental importance with a site of special scientific importance, that the biodiversity and environmental concerns are also taken into account. First Minister. I'm happy to give consideration to that wider point. I certainly accept uh, the importance of the environmental considerations for uh, the reasons the member has set out. Obviously, it's for the Scottish Government to set uh, the wider policy and strategic framework, which we will do through the draft energy strategy, through the just transition plan that I refer to, both of which will be published over the course of this year. Beyond that, I think it is right uh, that these plans are driven by local councils and, and local agencies. As I said earlier on, the Scottish Government is contributing over £100 million to the Ayrshire growth deal. So that balance between uh, local leadership and strategic direction from the Scottish Government is always one that we need to be careful to get right. But I'll give consideration to the wider point and uh, revert to the member as soon as possible. Jamie Green. 
Thank you. I too would like to thank the workforce at Hunterston who have been an integral part of the North Ayrshire economy, but also community. But nowhere in the question by Mr Gibson or indeed the First Minister's answer did I hear an explanation as to how the SNP's current moratorium on exploring new nuclear energy or technology, or even having a sensible debate about it, will support either job creation in North Ayrshire or secure reliable energy for Scotland. Why, therefore, First Minister, is the Scottish government, Scottish government simply not interested in exploring Scotland's potential to be a world leader in this field? First Minister. Well, people will continue to debate these issues, and that is right and proper. I and, and my party have made clear our views on new nuclear power over many years. Uh, in summary, uh, there are two uh, reasons lying behind that. New nuclear power is, is not good value for money for taxpayers, to be blunt about it. And there is uh, still the issue of what we do with the nuclear waste that comes from uh, nuclear power that nobody has been able really uh, to satisfactorily uh, resolve. Uh, of course, Scotland uh, has an abundance of renewable energy potential uh, in the not too distant future. We'll hear the outcome, for example, uh, of the Scotland uh, leasing round, which is about ensuring we maximise our offshore wind potential. Uh, we are focused on making sure, both for uh, our energy needs, but also for the jobs and economic uh, needs of the country, that we maximise uh, that vast renewable low carbon potential we have got. And that is uh, what we will continue to do. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what data the Scottish Government has collected on the number of people diagnosed with cancer and the stage at which they are diagnosed since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and how this compares with pre-pandemic data. First Minister. Public Health Scotland published latest staging data for breast, lung and colorectal cancers in November last year. Uh, that report showed that the number of people diagnosed at the earliest stage is lower than would have been expected had the COVID pandemic not happened. Uh, however, more recent data shows that more patients are being treated now on an urgent suspicion of cancer pathway compared to the situation pre-COVID. Uh, also, since the start of the pandemic, we have established the first early cancer diagnostic centres and launched public campaigns, including on lung cancer, to raise awareness of the vital importance of early diagnosis. And we've also committed an additional £20 million to the Detect Cancer Early Programme. Brian Whittle. I to thank the First Minister for that answer. But First Minister, I have a friend who has just been diagnosed with an aggressive form of prostate cancer that unfortunately has spread to other areas. He was diagnosed at stage three, having waited six months for his test. Now, the NHS is under severe pressure, as we are all aware, and this kind of story, I am sure, is replicated across the country. So, collection of this kind of data from non-COVID conditions is critical in planning for what challenges are coming down the track. Today, in COVID Recovery Committee, we were told by an adviser that inadequate data is not being collected so make proper inf to make these proper informed decisions on these matters. So does the First Minister agree with me that data collection analysis is crucial in forward planning, included for post-COVID planning? And if so, will the Scottish what will the Scottish Government do to support the development of data collection as quickly as possible to help the NHS as it plans its future strategy? First so, Minister. Firstly, yes, I do agree very strongly um, that data is important in all sorts of uh, areas, but here in particular to make sure that we are diagnosing cancer as early as possible and then treating cancer as quickly as possible. After that, I spoke in my initial answer about uh, the data uh, on staging that Public Health Scotland does publish, and I will certainly uh, speak to Public Health Scotland about uh, the additional data that it may be possible to uh, gather and to collect. Uh, we put a big focus on early diagnosis uh, for reasons everybody understands and have focused through the Detect Cancer Early programme on some of the most common cancers. Uh, but, of course, one of the, the functions and one of the purposes of the new early diagnostic uh, centres is to make sure uh, that symptoms that uh, are perhaps not the ones people uh, suspect uh, may be cancer uh, and uh, are, are also treated more urgently. So we're trying to widen uh, that net as much as possible. Uh, staging is really important in anybody's cancer uh, journey to make sure they're diagnosed as quickly as possible, but so too is access uh, to treatment. Uh, even during the COVID pandemic, once a decision to treat was made, cancer patients waited on average between two to five days 
uh, for treatment. So all of these different stages are important. Data is vital to understanding performance now and how we improve performance. And I'll certainly take the points made uh, back and have a further discussion with Public Health Scotland about them. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whilst COVID-19 has undoubtedly had a challenging impact on the delivery of NHS services, does the First Minister agree with me that the establishment of the three early cancer diagnostic centres that you've just mentioned, including the one in my constituency, are providing a welcome referral route for patients who do not have the standard cancer symptoms, and that this is going to be the way that we can get these patients on the most urgent of pathways, specifically where there are unfortunate cases of later stage diagnosis, due to the lack of the traditional presenting symptoms. First Minister. I, I agree very much with that, and it's the point I was uh, seeking to make in response to the, the previous question. Uh, the urgent, urgent suspicion of cancer referral route is, is one that's really important, uh, but it refers people who have symptoms that are most traditionally and commonly indicative of cancer. What the early cancer diagnostic centres are seeking to do is to add to that so that they are providing primary care with access to a, a new fast track diagnostic pathway for patients who have non-specific symptoms uh, that might be suspicious of cancer, for example, weight loss and, and fatigue, uh, which could be cancer, uh, but which may be other things. Uh, so that is widening uh, the ability of primary care to get people who might have cancer into that fast track pathway uh, as quickly as possible. So I think these centres really do add something very important and I hope they will give additional reassurance to people uh, who may be worried uh, that the symptoms they're suffering are indicative of a cancer diagnosis. Question number six, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government can provide to people struggling to pay their electricity bills. First Minister. Uh, powers over the energy market, of course, are reserved. Uh, we have written to the UK Government calling for urgent action to support uh, households. Uh, this, in our view, should include a reduction to VAT as one of the simplest short-term measures, as well as action on the warm homes discount and cold weather payment. Uh, we have also taken, uh, within our own powers and from our own resources, action through our £41 million winter support fund. That includes a £10 million fuel insecurity fund to help people with heating costs and provides £25 million of funding to local authorities to tackle financial insecurity. In addition, we continue to invest in trying to make people's homes warmer and more affordable to heat, with over a £1 billion allocated to tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency. And that £1 billion has been allocated since 2009. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the First Minister and note the mitigations, but added to the misery of skyrocketing energy bills, there is the 5% increase in the cost of living, £20 cut to the universal credit, national insurance hike, all pushing more Scots into poverty and desperation, all reserved to Westminster. But the impact on the fallout lands on our devolved public services. Therefore, does the First Minister agree with me that only with independence and full power over our economy could we prevent this economic tsunami and perhaps while I'm at it I'd invite Douglas Ross to join us in this because I'm sure he'll have a better political future in an independent Scotland. First Minister. These issues are really important and sometimes in this chamber we debate them as if they're abstract but they have real meaning uh, to people's lives. Inflationary pressures are going to be one of the biggest issues we're dealing with in the months to come and are going to have a really severe impact on household budgets. Uh, so we have to recognise as we try to decide how best to help people where the powers and the resources lie. Right now levers uh, over energy costs, 85% of welfare spending, powers over the minimum wage and national insurance, they're all held at Westminster. So while this parliament might want to act, it's not able to do. Uh, we've also seen a Westminster government take £20, 20 pounds a week uh, out of the pockets of the poorest families in our country. Um, and we see them, instead of helping, uh, do things that are actually making life harder uh, for those already struggling. 
So I do think it is the case, not in an abstract sense, but in a, a real tangible sense, that we take more of the powers that are being misused by Westminster into the hands of this Parliament so that we can use them in the interests of people across the country. And yes, Christine Graham is right. We can uh, try to do that through increased devolution, and we'll always try to do that. But fundamentally, the best way uh, of resolving this is for Scotland to become an independent country so this Parliament can take the decisions that are in the interests of the country country um, and not constantly uh, have to hope that a Prime Minister, uh, who everybody, I think, without exception in this chamber, thinks is unfit for office to take these decisions for us. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to members' business.